Attack of the Clones, Phantom Menace, Revenge of the Sith, The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, yeah? Well, you and your parents and your grandparents have been paying my salary for the last 42 years, and I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. Um, who can tell me, who can tell me what Star Wars is about? Who could, who's a big fan? Who's a big fan? What, what is Star Wars about to you, sir? What is it about? Story of the Jedi. Story of the Jedi, really? What is Star Wars about? Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> Star Wars is not about Jar Jar Binks, okay? It is so not about Jar Jar Binks. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you? Actually, I was just with, jo with uh, Ahmed Best in Chicago last week. What a great guy. And it was a great performance of character that George asked him to do. And Ahmed just acted so well. But it is not about Jar Jar Binks. What is Star Wars about? Yes. It is about C-3PO, the golden droid. Thank you. Thank you very much. You knew that all along, didn't you? Yes. Um, so, in 42 years, you can imagine I have a lot of, lot of stories to tell. But today, through the power of the Force, it is your chance to ask me questions, if you dare. Okay. So, um, just bear in mind that as, uh, as we sit here. Um, because 42 years culminates in me being here at Cyprus Comic Con. How great is that? Give yourself a round of applause for being at Cyprus Comic Con. Uh, and of course, I have my beautiful Princess Leia to, to be with me at all times. And you can wave. Uh, to, are, are you actually working? There we are. Look, quick wave there. So, um, so many of you Thank you. So many, because, darling, I'm the star of the show here, okay. <laughs> you get 30 seconds of fame, and then it's me, okay. Um, so many of you have not come in costume. Why? You what? I'm sorry, a Pokemon t-shirt doesn't cut it for me. Although the hat is brilliant. What have you got there? <gasps> They're not thermal detonators, are they? Somebody's wearing a thermal detonator. Oh, anyway, um, so yeah, you, uh, if you have questions, then let's share it. But I got lots of, lots of stories. Because some of those uh, things that happened to me way back in the day are so ingrained in my memory. And one of the things I loved reading the script was, of course, the way 3PO was also nervous. He was trained in protocol and etiquette. When did you last see anybody following the rules of etiquette or protocol in a Star Wars movie? None. Never again. Um, but one of the things I liked was the way he uh, responded to R2-D2. I thought it was magical. It was uh, the writers, George and the other writers, had put together this odd couple. And I loved it. It, it just made so much sense. It was so human, and yet they were robots. However, on the day... Picture this, we're out in Tunisia, and uh, very sandy, mm -hmm, difficult. And there is the sand crawler there, and 3PO had just been purchased by Uncle Owen and, and Luke Skywalker. And 3PO is going over to the dome, do you remember the dome home where, Anakin, and what was his name, Luke lived, yes? Stay with me, close. And if I get the names wrong, I have so many names in my head here. Okay, so help me. Luke lived there. And there was the dome home, and there were steps leading down. Do you remember? He goes downstairs. It's very difficult, because 3PO does not do stairs. Okay? They're dangerous. Dangerous for his kneecaps. More dangerous for my kneecaps. Okay? So now comes up the point. There is the camera over there, with George directing the assistant director, Tony Way. He's the voice you hear all the time on the set, you know, action, uh, turnover, all those kind of words. And more importantly, there is the guy with the remote controls for R2-D2. Because here we have this 
thing that is like an electric car full of batteries and, and wires and radio things. So the scene, the scene starts, action, and 3PO kind of goes up to the home, turns round because we knew that Red had exploded and now R2 is coming here. So up comes R2 and 3PO says, now don't you forget this, why I should stick my neck out for you is quite beyond my programming. <laughs> Cut, and I stopped on my mark, here. Two reasons I stopped on my mark. It was my mark. As a professional actor, I was doing what I was told. The second reason, if I took a step further, I would then fall all the way down the steps and join Mark Hamill down there with broken kneecaps, okay? So I stopped there. R2 didn't stop there. Suddenly, boom, I am being rammed from behind by this demented machine. This was the first scene I was in with R2-D2, the very first scene. And already, it had decided to kill me. <laughs> R2 wanted to be the star of the show, but as our friend said, Star Wars is about 3PO. So, as a professional person, I was standing there, they are running, they are now running from the camera as fast as they can to because I am protecting it because I knew this was a very expensive object, right? So I'm kind of doing that. So they come, they switch him off, we go back to what we call number one. Number one is the first position that you started in. They go back to the camera. The guy with the controls goes back to the camera and I hear action. Now, don't you forget this. Why I should stick my neck out for you is quite beyond um, my capacity. <laughs> Cut. Except R2 doesn't stop. If he thought, if he was ramming me hard the first time, it, by this point he was going really for it. They're running again, running again. So we go back to number one again. <laughs> Action. And watch this. Why? Why I should stick my neck out for you is quite beyond my capacity and you watch the movie, I then go, <laughs> and he stopped right on the mark. He was, he was after me all the time. <laughs> you watch the movie, you watch the movie. The second, the second shock, and this was a real shock, that one was kind of an accident, because one day I did try the remote controls and it was really difficult. I mean, uh, you know, I had to give them away before I really wrecked it. But the other thing was more premeditated. In the original script, it says, 3PO says this, R2 beeps a response. 3PO replies, R2 blats an answer. Totally normal script. Me, it, me, it. Me, it. Me, it. Me, me. It, it, me, and so on. On the day, it came as a real shock, I promise you. There was a scene particularly... <laughs> I know it's raining outside, but here we have bottled rain. This is very, very strange. We'll leave it there, it can't fall any further. Um, there was a scene particularly, and th there's a picture on my uh, table there of R2 here, 3PO here, out in the desert with 3PO saying, um, what a desolate place this is. I've got to rest before I fall apart. My joints are almost frozen. Wait a minute, where are you going? Nothing. Well, what makes you think there are settlements over there? Nothing. Oh, go that way. And I think I'd been standing there for two hours whilst they tried to get R2 to roll up. In the end, they put boards down out of sight and they hauled it up on a piano wire, very strong wire. But at that point, I said to George, Could, do you think you could, somebody could go, I don't know, beep or something when I finished my line, because it's very hard to think 
through the conversation with just me speaking. Could somebody like go beep or something? Oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, so we started again, and I got a rest before. Well, wait a minute. Where are you going? Oh, er, beep. <laughs> After that, I decided I was on my own. And it was very, very difficult because I had to learn the whole scenes, all of the scenes with R2, just making it up inside my head. But the first time I spoke was outside the sand crawler again. Do you remember? We're lined up with all the other droids. And my first line was something like, Uncle Owen comes up, do you speak Barchi? Well, I said, it's um, but like a second language for me. Um, and then I had the line, I'm program, uh, the programming of uh, binary load lifters. I couldn't say it. Action. Well, sir, my first job was programming. <laughs> Cut. Do it again. Action. Do you speak? Yeah. Why, sir, my first job was. Cut. Action. Why, sir, my first job was. Cut. George came up to me very close, looked in my face and said, don't worry about the voice. We can fix it later. You can say anything you want. How weird was that? I was used to being in plays where if you said something different than the script, the other actors would look at you like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so action, we did it for the thing. Because I could tell I, he, I'd already annoyed him. Um, Why, sir? My first job was wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Terrific cut. <laughs> and George was happy. What I didn't realize, when he said, we can fix the voice later, he really meant it. We carried on filming for mm, 12 weeks. That's how long it took to do principal photography, the ones with cameras that uh, film what you're doing, as opposed to special effects. And there we were. I finally, I had a a microphone here and a transmitter. It was very bad quality. So you always have to replace actors' voices in these big films. And so finally, I get to America. They ring up and they say, we need you in LA to put your voice on the movie. And I walk into the studio and the guy, the engineer says, oh, you're Anthony. Well, <laughs> it's incredible you got here finally because you know, we spent a couple of months looking for a voice for your character because, you know, George really hates your perf Oh, hi, George. Here's Anthony. Look. <laughs> I didn't even say, hello, George. I was really shocked. I said, you hated my performance? And George, you could tell, was a bit embarrassed. He kind of went, well, I kind of never thought of him as being a British butler. Mm. I'd never thought of anything else. Had George said to me, you know, this British butler thing's awful, don't do it, can you do something else? I would have tried. I would have offered him something different. He didn't, he didn't ask me. So there I was putting my voice on, and finally, of course, that's the, the, the thing you hear in the movies. Um, and interestingly, I had a little microphone here and a cable that went all the way around to a transmitter shoved up my butt. But remembering I was in Hollywood, everybody in Hollywood speaks out of their butt. So, <laughs> so who has? So there were two things at the beginning that were very strange for me, working with uh, the R2 unit, uh, but of course working with Luke Skywalker, Mark Hamill. And one of the things I think that makes 3PO very real is that Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker, talks to 3PO as if he is a real, genuine, uh, helper, assistant, friend, and you believe Mark Hamill, you believe Luke Skywalker, and therefore you believe in C-3PO. And I, I think that's a pretty neat, pretty neat way of, of doing it. Has anybody got a question in the few minutes we have together? Think about it. I shall walk amongst you. I shall make it easy for you. It is your chance to star in, in this thing. And right at the front, can we have a camera somewhere here? Have you given up on us, sir? Ah, uh, oh, we're reloading. We're having a battery failure. And how many times did my eyes go out in a shot? And George would come up to me at the end of a shot and say, 
his eyes went out. I mean, full of anger and fury, because I was wasting time, in my face. And it wasn't my fault. It means that the battery pack, which um, is, can, are you able to yeah, you can see, you can zoom in a bit. You can zoom in a bit. No, we can't zoom in a bit. It's a very cheap production. Um, uh, my eyes would go out uh, because I had a six pack of batteries uh, behind me here. And of course, one day in uh, episode six, I was in agony. I thought my dresser, uh, Toby, had left a screwdriver in my back because I used to annoy him so much. Uh, actually, really, I loved him. He was terrific. What had happened, it wasn't a screwdriver digging into me. It was the batteries shorting out. I was being baked alive. And of course, in that costume, I can't, I can't get out, you know? So um, uh, you had a question. Where are you? Stand up. Stand, stand up. Yeah. Where are you? Oh, sit down. You're too tall. <laughs> I, I, oh, all right. Come, come here. I always wanted to be tall, and I don't think it's ever going to happen, is it? Uh, just back up a bit. I'm trying to get the lights a bit, but what's your name? Aris. Aris. What's your question, Aris? Uh, first of all, I just want to say I've really liked your work a lot. And yeah, now I want to say my question. <laughs> so, uh, no, no, let, us, let us say that again. What, what was it you liked about my work? <laughs> he, he liked about my work. Yes. Well, um, when I was younger, I always used to have this C-3PO figure. And it was like one of my favorite toys. So, And I still have it to this very day. So when I heard you were coming to Comic-Con, I was genuinely excited. And then I saw the prices to meet you, and I was like, shh, not anymore. <laughs> OK, OK, well, it does cost a lot to get. Uh, this time last week, I was in Chicago uh, with all the other guys. So it does take a bit to get me. Do you still have your figure with you? It's at my house. It's at your, uh, your house. OK, well, uh, is, it, is it kind of, what's it like? Is it uh, still in good condition? I would think so, yeah. So you played with it gently. It, it's not, because some, uh, sometimes the figures can go a little floppy. Yeah, kind of, yeah. It's gone a little, it's gone a little floppy, has it? Because, yeah, uh, me too, you know, it, it's been some years. Well, um, but you were telling me how brilliant I was and how wonderful my, <laughs> how wonderful my acting is, weren't you? You, you suddenly went off about a toy. I, I, I don't make my, the toy, I, I act. My question is, um, what does it feel like having a toy made after your character that you know kids <laughs> would play with? Uh, what is it like having a toy? It did come, actually, as, as a kind of shock. It's a, oh, that's a close-up there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Anybody else got a floppy C-3PO at home? <laughs> you are the only one. <laughs> no, this is good. Uh, you got a floppy one. Right, okay. And the gentleman there, too. Um, what I love is when people play with the toys. They don't leave them in boxes, collectors, items. You know, they are made to be played with back in the day. And people do bring me really floppy 3 pos with all the gold taken off because they've been played with so well. Uh, what other toys did you have? Sorry, you were telling me I was a brilliant actor. Yes. Yeah, and you got a toy. So but tell me about my acting. What is so brilliant about it? Well, I really liked uh, the like what you were telling me about, uh, not me specifically, <laughs> all of us, about how you worked with R2-D2. I thought it was, um, I didn't actually know they programmed it and they had controls for it. I thought they just let it go, you know? Well, it, it, they didn't. They did have controls, but frequently it would go off on its own because it would pick up the radios. You know, we're, we are 40 years ago. And back then, technology you know, wasn't like it is today. Now you have the R2-D2's Builders Club, who I hope maybe next year will come to Cypress Comic Con, because they make uh, these droids themselves, and they work perfectly. R2-D2 would regularly go off on its own or just go crazy. He would pick up the uh, radio signals from the walkie-talkie sets. More alarmingly, he would pick up if there was a local cab firm who, and so he would go driving off to some strange destination because he just received instructions to go and pick up a passenger. You think I'm kidding. And then, of course, um, in, uh, yeah, keep, look, look, it's a star, look at you, beautiful. Um, uh, when we were in uh, the desert on Return of the Jedi, uh, we were near Edwards Air Force Base, and he just, that place is thick with radio signals. And he was picking up, now he wasn't just the local cab firm, he was flying jets, he was flying troop delivery vehicles, everything. And 
it was a very difficult job, uh, which, which they did pretty well. We got through a bunch of, um, of controllers in the end. But of course, you believe everything in the movie. Sometimes it is being pulled on a wire, and sometimes Kenny Baker would be inside wobbling it. But uh, as a piece of uh, technology, it's really come on. B about my acting again, we got on to R2D2. Um. How about my use of mime, the ability to create an emotion with a completely blank face? Was that pretty phenomenal? Well, I think you answered I think it was very good. Yes, I agree with you. Um, because it's not easy uh, to... <laughs> 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 I'm so bad, aren't I? Um, can you hold that whilst I do on my shoelace? Because you, you, you wouldn't want me to die. Um, <laughs> thank you. So, better now. You see, on a film set, you have people to dress you. You don't have to tie up your own shoelaces. But here, Cyprus Comic Con, who can take... Any questions from over here? Yes, we, we stand up. We have a camera somewhere near us, if I can find out. That, uh, look. Are we on, uh, I don't know the camera numbers. No, no, that's the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're, uh, here's the camera. Yes, you don't look at the screen. You, the, can, can you wave, please, cameraman? Can you wave? Thank you, see, see him wave? Uh, you, think, you think you've got it? Uh, okay, look at you. No, look, look at the camera. Yes, thank you very much for being with us here in Cyprus today. Uh, one of the things I like most uh, in Star Wars is the way C-3PO delivers his lines, and I'm very glad that George Lucas kept the British butler type of... Uh, <laughs> because that really adds a lot to the movie. And I just want to ask you, which one is your favorite line of all the lines you've delivered? Well, f first of all, thank you for those wonderful remarks about uh, how brilliant I am. Um, <laughs> And uh, the interesting thing is now, when I tell people that George wasn't going to use my voice at the beginning, but you know, he wasn't going to use Frank Oz's voice as Yoda. Oh, I mean, you can't imagine Yoda any other way, can you? And you honestly can't imagine 3PO any other way because you have been now uh, kind of brainwashed that that is 3PO, that's Yoda, and, and so on. So um, George you know, had to go through a process of choosing the right voice. And your question was my favorite line? Yes. My favorite line. What's your favorite line? Do you remember? Um, in uh, Return of the Jedi, when the, when the door of Jabba the Hutt's palace opens and C-3PO goes, goodness gracious me. Oh, that's, that's right. <laughs> goodness gracious me. <laughs> um, my favorite line is very short. Uh, it's, we're doomed. <laughs> Because the more you think about it these days, that was so prescient. But actually, the other, the other line I do enjoy, or 3PO particularly enjoyed, was when, um, you know, remember Han Solo was always a bit mean to 3PO, yes? You know, a bit cruel, a bit bullying. I mean, basically, 3PO has been bullied over the last nine movies. Do you realize this? He's been ignored, mistreated, ill-treated, put down. That's so sad, because he's always there to help. He wants to tell you the truth. He wants to warn you that you're in danger. Do you feel in danger now? No. Because you were looking a little worried that I was going to come near you. Um, <laughs> so then uh, we're in uh, the Ewok forest. And there is Han Solo, who has been captured by my friends. You'll remember that the Ewoks thought I was some kind of god. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, Han Solo is above a, a fire. Do you remember? He's hanging over a fireplace. Um, and he says, 3PO, what are they saying? And 3PO goes, um, it appears, Captain Solo, that you are to be the main course at a banquet given in my honor. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if I may add something, I see there's a stormtrooper over there. So maybe we should tell them, this is not the droid you're looking for. Very good. Thank you very much. Very much, yeah. I, I mean, the stormtroopers. Um, the stormtroopers were pretty scary, but not really, because the costumes. Would you, sir, officer? Would you, would you come here? Just um, okay. We're going to have to work on the walk. Okay, okay. <laughs> so now you're going to walk to. You're going to think I'm an officer. I'm a. Um, Stormtrooper, much better. And now you're going to come and ask me for my identification in the manor. Action. Oh. Fancy 
your papers. That's very, very good, because you were me a big hand. This is, but now, if I can use you as a demonstration, if you, if you won't mind, where's the, can we come on this camera? I don't know what numbers are. This one, this one, the one in front of me. Go. No, that's the one behind me. That's the one of them. I'm the star. Put me on. Are you, are you functioning? <laughs> this one. Hello. Uh, uh, this, this is wonderful. In a, in a, in a, in a funny sort of way. Um, anyway, all right, we'll do it to this one then. Oh, over here. Good. This is your close-up. No, don't shoot it. We finally found one. It's working. Right. The, you had an example of a, what's your, what, your PC officer? TK22310. TK22310, got it? TK, there'll be questions later. Listen, uh, you saw how macho TK22210 was then. You know, uh, I need to see your identification. In reality, when they were filming, that was all very good. But in reality, when off duty, you would see bunches of stormtroopers sitting together in a kind of sewing bee. Because if I may point, just move your arms sideways, would you? All the edges of the costumes are, were very sharp plastic, bad enough on your arms, because they would uh, scratch and they would nip the, uh, the body underneath. Particularly bad was the area I'm pointing to off camera. <laughs> it's down here. Okay. So you would see them sitting together, and they would be sticking cotton wool, what we in England call cotton wool, so like medical cotton, around the edges so that they would be more comfortable. So stormtroopers are not quite as mean as they appear. Thank you very much, sir. Um, is that... So who, who's got a question over here? I can tell this is the, the uh, yes. And do we have a camera here? But we're in the dark, so this is the dark side, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's quite a good joke, I thought. I made that up on the spot. No, can you see, you can't see us now. Here we go. Hello, uh, I'd like to ask if there was any moment uh, during filming which was improvised by you. And not including, not including the script. Um, was there any, it's a very good question, um, improvised acting, and I'm really thinking, because on the whole in a movie, you can't really improvise because it's all very carefully lit, each scene, uh, uh, like this. I mean, you know, <laughs> look at the perfect lighting. Um, <laughs> you can't, um, you can't, there we are, we've found, we found a way of lighting me. Yes. Um, in a film, in a film like Star Wars, it is so carefully lit for each scene, and not only each scene, but each angle of each scene. So you might do a shot, there might be six setups on one scene, uh, a wide shot, an establishing sh shot, a two shot, two shot there, maybe a three shot, single, 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 single. And the editor puts all that together. But in each of those shots, whether it's a single or a two shot or a medium close up or a close up um, or a reverse, each one of those has to be lit perfectly so the film looks consistent. And so if you are in a scene, people need to know what you are going to say and do because if I suddenly decide to run over here, that's not going to work because I'm now out of focus because of my mark, exactly, because um, as an actor, you are told where to stand, and it can be it can be a little chalk mark on the floor. In the forest, it can be a twig that's a little different from the other twigs. In, on the studio floor, it can be a bean bag. And a bean bag can be like a bean bag, or it can be like a roll, or in my case, at one point, they made me a T-shape, which means you stand in the middle and your toes are either side of it, and they made me a gold T-shaped mark just for fun. The trouble is that I actually can't see the floor. To see, to, to see the floor and my mark, I mean, uh, I can see now if I come up to there, here is my mark. See, I missed it then. Um, in reality, if I was to see that, I would have to count, rehearse, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I should be there. Um, I would count. And of course, sometimes I got it wrong and we'd have to do it again. 
or spectacularly, if it was a bean bag or a roll, I would trip up on it and fall into the camera. Um, so for the most part, you don't ad lib. Occasionally, the odd line can slip in, uh, and certainly I can ad lib in post-production, but on the whole, you do what you're told, because otherwise they'll get another actor in, okay. Very, it's a, a very good question, that, though. Yeah, any questions? All these people who are late, see me afterwards, yes. Ju ju just stand up so we can see you. I was going to say that. Well, but, no, 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 no. Th this is a speaking stick, yeah? <laughs> and you have come here. You have to speak. Okay, you speak into this end. Okay. Okay. I just want to say that I have your favorite line on my shirt. I kind of thought that since you would be here today, it would have been great too. Look at, look at, can we get a close? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that superb? That, and, and, Th th I, sorry, I should have noticed it. I think I should have your T-shirt. Uh, obviously, later. Um, wh what do you think? <laughs> I, th I think probably it looks better on you. I, I, I don't know. Um, why you, do you agree we're doomed? We're doomed. Yes. Yeah. Actually, when I wear it, I like. I wore it when I went to go and do my GCSEs. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that was quite fitting. And I'm probably gonna go and wear it when I do my A levels now. So. The, the, the great thing about getting older is you don't ever have to do GCSEs or A-levels. I cannot tell you the relief. Um, well, thank you. What's your name? Nick. Nick, thank you. And that's really made my day. And indeed, the young lady over there, she'll be pleased. Terrific. Thank you. Um, any, any other questions? Yeah. The lady who totally, first of all, what, what have you come as? Okay, come here. Look at, okay. It's gold in honor of 3PO. Yeah, and the, and, the, and the turquoise bits, who's that in honor of? That's just a little bit of... That's uh, just, just the gold. Uh, who, who are you? Uh, I'm from a game, video game, Skyrim. It's a character you play. Okay. And is it comfortable? Because uh, um, most of the um, questions I get asked are, like, is it harder in the costume? Uh -huh. Oh, how did you get in the costume? Because you look a little tall. Oh, you played the other one. Oh, okay. Uh, th that from a journalist, believe it or not. Uh, what is your question? Uh, I have a few, if that's all right. Is it okay? Got a few? Yes or no? Yes, yes or no? Yes. We need some enthusiasm here, guys. Yes or no? Yes. They'd better be good questions. You're telling uh, us about the in. Should I hold it, or are you okay? Get your card. So about the. You were telling us about. Sorry. This could take some time. Get on. With it. Uh, the scene where R2 was nudging you. Was that um, in Revenge of the Sith? No, sorry, in the Clone Wars. There's a scene where R2 nudges 3PO down uh, in the factory. Was that a little? A little reference, no, um, th that was, um, uh, you know, R2-D2 is always more gung-ho than, uh, than 3PO, and you get on with it, you know, it's part of the dynamic, so, uh, no, that's proper, proper uh, scripting. Oh, okay, so that wasn't planned just uh, as a joke, all right, fair enough. Uh, yeah, uh, now you were saying George didn't tell you to be the English butler, like, what, what were your instructions, what made you think <laughs> to make... What was my instructions for um, being C-3PO? Um, they made the suit. It took six months to make the suit. And they promised me that I would have the entire suit so I could rehearse in a studio with mirrors, so I could see, like in a gym, and a camera with closed circuit that I could see what worked and what didn't work. Um, they promised that. A week before we went to Tunisia, they gave me the whole suit. For the first time, I saw it laid out complete on the table. And we tried it on, and I wore it for probably f 15, 10 minutes, and I kind of blundered around, bumping into things. And then it was horrible. It was horrible. Horrible. I took it off, and I said, all right, now I need it to go and rehearse. Uh-uh. It had to be freighted that week to get Tunisia before I did. I never rehearsed in it. The first time I wore it was outside uh, the Santa Crawler. 
And it had taken two hours to dress me up in it. Two hours of being poked and prodded and screwed in and nipped and everything. And finally, finally, when I was ready, they, we were in a tent and they parted the, the, f the flaps of the front. And I stepped out into the sunlight. Threepio stepped out for the first time ever. And the crew, I could see the crew there in front of the sand crawler. And they were all looking at me. And I remember the American, bunch of American crew here. And they were saying, oh my god, that's incredible luck. Yeah, wow, the gold man, he's fantastic. And here was a bunch of British crew. And they were going, it's rather good, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And then there were the Tunisian helpers that seriously, I mean, practically, they fell on their knees, kind of salaming, because they, they thought I was the nearest thing to it. I mean, Ewoks hadn't been invented, but they were so impressed with seeing this. It was a very simple village we were in. At that point, we were out in the, uh, the sand, uh, uh, the salt flats. And so I was this enormous, I made this enormous impact on, on the crew. And... Uh, uh, that felt good. I felt horrible inside. It was awful. I was locked in this world all day for the first day, all day, including lunch. I said, somebody blew a whistle. And I said, you know, what's that? And my dresser, um, Maxie, said, uh, it's lunch. And I turned, and indeed, over there, uh, about 100 yards away, was the food. And he said, shall I bring you something? And I thought, well... <laughs> You know, I couldn't, I couldn't get out of this costume. Eventually, they stuck a straw and I had a sip of water all day from seven in the morning to seven at night. All day. I couldn't eat, I couldn't, I could drink water through a straw. I couldn't sit down, I couldn't go to the little droid's room. Seven o'clock at night when the sun went down because you're there waiting for the sun, using the sun, it's why you're on location, apart from the beautiful a vision you have, you're working with the weather. And so at the end of that day, yeah, I'd, I'd kind of had enough. That was day one, totally day one. And I'd got another 12 weeks of this. I was not happy. What was your question? <laughs> Why am I telling you? Did you inspire me to say that? Um, oh, and I should say that on that first day, I am the star. I mean, it's a beautiful costume, but I'm the star here, okay. On, um, people kept coming up to me saying, you look wonderful, that's fantastic, you look great, you're brilliant, brilliant. That was day one. Day two, not so much. Day three, <laughs> they forgot I was there. I was totally an object. Because I was playing an object, rather well, I think we'll agree, they believed me, and so they completely ignored the fact I was in there. I had I'd ceased being a star pretty much immediately. It was a bit sad, really. So day one, time. What was your next question? Uh, now that 3PO's character is well-known and well-loved, have you told Lucas, like, I told you so? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that would be cruel. I think, I think George is big enough to know. You know, he thought of so many things in, uh, in that series of films that you can forgive him the odd moment of uh, getting, getting it wrong. He was big enough to change his mind, after all. But he really wanted, as I found out later, to have a character that was like a car dealer from the Bronx in New York. Can you imagine, like, really sleazy, you know, kind of... Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure I could have done that, but I, I would have tried. I would have tried, yes. Another question? One of the... Well, you could have asked when I was over there. At my age, trekking around this room is not easy. Okay, um... I forget, I was going to say something then, but now you've interrupted. What's your name? George. It's what's George? Yes. Hi, George. Hi. Um, well, my question is, uh, your ability um, to express your feelings and emotions while actually not showing your face, and I think it's truly amazing, and I wanted to ask, uh, what's your... You see, from the young, the truth comes out. <laughs> Thanks, George. So, what is your process, and how easy or how difficult is it to actually be able to do that? It's a, seriously, it's a really good question. When I was at uh, drama school, one of the classes I was quite good at was mime. We, we did everything. Um, 
I'm sorry. Am I boring you? S stand up. Only who, if somebody's going to misbehave in class, what kind of person would it be? What would they be wearing but a Darth Vader t-shirt? <laughs> Go away. Um, it's a very good question. And one of the exercises one did at drama school um, in class was to wear a plastic face with no features. So just, it looked like human, but it didn't have all the detail. And you had to express using parts of your body in other ways to get an emotion out of it. And the other thing is the extraordinary uh, costume of 3PO himself. And that was sculpted on a model of my body, so they took a plaster cast of me, and then Liz Moore, the sculptor, covered me over in, or covered the body over in clay. And then she made this face of 3PO that is so beautiful in repose, it's just a beautiful face. And it's blank enough, it looks beautiful, but it's blank enough that I could write any emotion, whether it's happy or sad. You know, the crudest example is, you know, to be sad. We feel emotions often in the middle of our tummy here, so you kind of crumple a bit and maybe the shoulders and all that kind of thing. So I had the tools to do it. And one of the best bits for me that I ever saw was when Alec Guinness has just been swiped in half by Darth Vader, and 3PO's on the Millennium Falcon, just sitting absolutely still, slightly with his head on one side, just looking so sad. But it helps also, do you realize, that the audience because you were sad at the time watching. You just thought, yeah. Obi-Wan has died. You felt sad. You see me on screen being sad, and you believe me. So we're working together. We work, the audience and the, the actors really are working together, even though we're miles apart, years apart, possibly. So it's a joint thing. We need the audience. Thank you very much for Thank your you. wonderful <laughs> question. I really like that. Yes, Bart, yes. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank you for your work. Um, not just for your work, but I, I love the fact that you embraced the character and you embraced the fans, and we're very, very thankful about that. So thank you very much. I love the small tidbits of information, like you give, like behind the scenes stuff that you do. And I know that you have a book coming out, and I love. <laughs> No, I actually love reading that book. So, uh, well, so I would love to read that book. So if you could just tell us some stuff about that book. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as some of you may know, I have, in fact, written a book. And this is the, the front cover uh, that you can see. Um, the actual book, just in case people are confused, is a little smaller than this. This is a blow-up photograph, OK? It's a real book size. And as you can see, it says, I am C-3PO, the inside story, Anthony Daniels, and most importantly, forward by J.J. Abrams. Ah, adore this man, he is bringing you the best film ever. And in this book, it starts with, I think it really starts with me meeting George. And you know, I didn't want to meet George, I didn't want to be in this silly, low-budget science fiction film as a robot. Uh, uh, uh. No. Um, you okay? Stay with me. Um, I didn't want to meet him, but my agent made me go, and I walked in, and he, George was so tiny, so non-American, flashy, big Hollywood, he was just a nice person. But importantly on the wall was a Ralph Macquarie concept painting of what the character would look like. And um, that's where this all began. I fell in love with the painting. And so the book carries you through pretty much in chronological order of films. But around that, I also talk about the difficulties of being in a, in a bigger... Can we go back to uh, a close-up of me because I'm the star and we've done the book now. Uh, everybody got the title all together? I stop on action altogether. Action. That's great. I didn't even do. do shut up. That's uh, enough. Um, I didn't even do a Jedi mind trick there. That was pretty cool. Thank you. Um, it it is a story that I realize is um, 
you know, Star Wars is all about a hero's journey. It's about Luke Skywalker and other people going through uh, passages of their life, good and bad and dangerous and uh, happy and all that. And I realized at the end of writing the book that I had actually been on a journey myself. It started in a very strange way. It became stranger and a bit sad. And then it grew into something else and other things happened and uh, all sorts of spin-off activities and experiences, whether meeting fans, always the fans is a big theme through it, whether it was being at the Academy Awards or being on The Muppet Show or Sesame Street or heaven help us, the holiday special. Anybody see the holiday special? Big no-no. Um, it's on YouTube. You can actually fast forward and live it. it, it it's terrifyingly bad. And then we had the Christmas, uh, Christmas in the Stars. Right? It goes through all sorts of things that I've experienced whilst you have been watching me inside there. You get to hear what I'm thinking. It's out in uh, this country, I think, in October. So you may in enjoy it. And thank you for that question. Because many times there are stories that I want to share, and I can't always be at a convention. Um, so you can read it for yourself. Ideal present for Christmas comes out just in time. <laughs> and believe me, DK, the publishers, have said um, it's Anthony's first book. They're wrong. They're so wrong. It is Anthony's last book, because I'm never doing it again. It's a, it's a ton of work. So do you think your dad would like to buy that book for Christmas? No. Yes. Maybe. <laughs> well, please yourself, you know what I mean. Well, just in case, I'm going to give you that card so you can, you can think about it. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the, um, one of the lovely things that, that happened in the first movie I'd never been in a film. Uh, I was a stage actor, a radio uh, and television, all that kind of thing. So I never thought to be in a real film. And of course, you've heard how I met George. And they're, they're going out to uh, Tunisia on the plane. We had to charter a flight. Um, there were all sorts of people. And I realized, sitting opposite me across the aisle was Alec Guinness, Sir Alec Guinness. And I was... I'm sure a lot of you know his work, his uh, superb work in, in film and indeed on stage. Um, and eventually I plucked up courage to speak to him and introduced myself and all that kind of thing. And um, when we arrived in Tunisia, Tozer, um, he got into his limo. I, I had a bus here. Not, no, it wasn't my bus. Everybody was on the bus. Sir Alec was in the limo with his wife, Merrila. And um, he looked, uh, he saw me and he sort of beckoned over and he got out of the car he said, and he was reaching in his pocket. He said, um, have they given you your per diem yet? I had no idea what he meant. I'd failed Latin at school so many times, GCSE, A level. Oh. Um, have they given you your per diem yet? Your pocket money, because they seem to have given me rather a lot and I think you should have some. How could you not love that man? And of course, he, grow, he grew to be the most wonderful guru in all of our lives, Obi-Wan Kenobi. And he was a wonderful person to work with. He took care of me, because filming was a little weird, a new experience for me, and he really looked after me. And then it went on and on, we made the film, and we all thought, including Sir Alec, we all thought it was like rubbish, uh, yes? Carrie Fisher thought it was rubbish. Mark Hamill thought it was rubbish. Han Solo, um, Harrison Ford, total rubbish. And me, utter nonsense. No idea what was going on. But we had all learned the lines. We were all professional actors. And we all did what we were told with full heart and full energy. And then they went away to edit it. And there was a big silence. And then suddenly the cover of Time or Newsweek, bam, bang. This film is huge. People went in, there was no pre-budget for advertising. People just went in, sat there, went, wow. And then went out and got their friends who came and said, wow. And so that's two wows. And then it grew incrementally. And the word now is viral. It was the first film to actually go viral. And do you know what? Without the fans, 
people who became fans, short for the word fanatic, not crazy, just people who really enjoy the worlds that George created with our help. And it was the first time that that ever happened. And that meant we had to make, we were allowed to make another film. And because of that, another film. And then there was a pause, and then we went back and made three more films here. And then there was less of a pause, and suddenly you have three more films here. And I am the only person to be in all of them. Thanks. And there, of course, takes me, takes me to think about what we were doing in Chicago just now. To, uh, a, week last, a week today, we were in Chicago talking principally about episode nine. Yes, what's it called? The Rise of Skywalker. I'm in that one too. And I honestly believe, whereas I thought the first one was a bit meh, my impression of uh, The Rise of Skywalker, you are totally going to love it. There is so much in there. And J.J. Abrams has wrapped the story very neatly. I think you're going to like it. But one reason we're making episode nine is because you wanted to see it. You saw all the other episodes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And some of you liked things better than others, but you have always been there. You have given me work and the other people work for 42 years. As I said at the beginning, I'm really grateful. And I'm grateful for your loving support and your friendliness and your interest and all those people who've been brave enough to ask questions and all that kind of thing. Because we are actually one family. We just come from different sides. We contribute in the way we do. And next time, you will all come in costume. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. <laughs>